Hello everyone, welcome to the 24th session of Light at the End of the Tunnel. My name is Alison Cleary and I am a Director of Parlour amongst many other things in my life, as we all are. Um, possibly something we'll look at today, flexibility. Uh, this series, as many of you know, Light at the End of the Tunnel is a collaboration between Parlour and Monash Architecture. Before we start, as always, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country across Australia's many nations and recognise the continuing connection to land, water and culture. In particular, we acknowledge the people of the Greater Kulin Nations who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Monash operates. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parlour community. Uh, this series, as you know, is looks into architecture as a profession, discipline and practice and how it is and will be affected by the pandemic and what comes after. Today's session is looking at flexibility and we're very fortunate to have Brian Kloisi, I don't think I said that right, Brian, um, here to ad offer advice and insight and Justin will be introduced, Justine will be introducing Brian shortly. But before we get to the interesting bits, we have to do the protocols, which you're probably many of you are familiar with. Please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're actually speaking. But we ask you to leave your camera on if you're willing to do that, as we like to see your faces and it gives us a greater sense of connection and community. These events are informal, uh, but informative. Justine and I will be asking questions throughout to keep things going, but we also like to take questions from the floor as it is. Uh, so please, if you have a question, put it into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We will then choose questions and ask you to actually come onto screen and ask them yourself. If you're not able to do that, let us know and we will repeat the question for you on your behalf. Please feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat Remember that everybody can see it, so don't make rude comments about anybody, um, unless you want them to know. Uh, it's very interesting to hear what you think. Um, and so if you've got experiences that align with the topic, please put them in there. Um, and while we're not always able to get to all of the questions, they do inform our future events and plans. So now, Justine. Thank you, Alison. Like Brian. Thank you, Alison. Um, so it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces here yet again and of course many of you will know that flexibility is a topic that we've um, spoken about many times in these sessions as we've discussed other you know other topic areas so now we're going to focus directly on why flexibility matters what it is and the mechanisms and supports that can um, the systems that can support flexible work um, and of course, this is really important right now. Um, as you may have seen in the invitation to the event, um, in the workplace wellbeing and work uh, survey that we ran a few months ago, 97% of the respondents um, indicated that they see an opportunity to improve workplaces and work cultures uh, following experiences during the pandemic. And the thing that people wanted most was flexibility, that thing that came up again and again and again, and the long form answers is the importance of flexibility. So the question, of course, is how do we do this? Um, and how do we take what we've learned during the pandemic and before and um, help that, use that to help reshape the way we work and where we work? So as Alison said, we're very lucky to have Brian Closey with us uh, today to help us discuss this. Uh, Brian's Head of People and Character at Bly Volumield, uh, BVN, and a founding member of the Architects Champions for Change group. BVN has done an enormous amount of work to support flexibility in recent years, uh, predating the pandemic. And last year, it won the inaugural Best in Practice Award from the New South Wales Institute of Architects. Brian and the practice are really keen to share what they have learned over recent years. Um, and they had planned an, an event on this topic, uh, which was one of the first casualties of the pandemic. So we're very pleased to have Brian here with us um, today to start um, that conversation of, of sharing what they've learned. Um, welcome, Brian. Nice to have you here. Um, excuse my dog. <laughs> So 
Brian, I wonder if you could just um, start by telling us a little about what it is that you do. What does being kid of people and character actually mean? You're on, I think you need to unmute. How about now? Oh, and I need to stop sharing. <laughs> Great, there we go. <laughs> okay, so thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's a new role to BVN that we created in 2019, and it came out of the fact that I was doing studio director role in Sydney for four years. And what we recognize is that um, projects obviously consume us. And then when you're trying to manage the people side of it, in the day to day, you find that you can, you always say, oh, wouldn't it be great to do this? Or, wouldn't it be great to do this? If we time, we do this. And with that mounting um, kind of to-do list or nice to, to have list, we recognize that actually we need a role that's focused on developing the vision and strategy for all things people. And that's where it came about. And in essence, what it's about is looking at um, learning development for people, um, how we bring people into the practice, how we keep people at BVN, uh, how we create an effective, diverse, um, fair and respectful culture in the practice that everyone can participate and feel like they've got a sense of place and meaning. And I guess the key to it is, and in any of these roles, and I've been very fortunate with this, is that I have a, I'm part of what we call the studio planning group. And that's the group charged with running the day-to-day all aspects of the practice. So I'm sitting there with, if you like, a people lens for every decision and topic that's been discussed. So it's not that I'm brought in because someone thinks, oh, this is a people thing. What we recognize is that everything has an impact on our people. So that's my job, if you like, to um, make sure that we're considering what is the impact on our people in everything that we do. And then it's creating policies and guidelines to implement in the practice. And it's not about tipping it into the practice is then living it with our people, understanding what's not working, how do we improve it, how do we make it better. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's as I say, it was a new role, so there was no precedent of what it should or shouldn't be, and I think it's been evolving for the last uh, year and a bit, but yeah, it's working in close partnership with the principals and the studio directors, so yeah, it's fun. And often, Often these kinds of things are seen as HR and they're in their the roles are taken by people with HR experience, but you're trained as an architect and very experienced as an architect, I believe. Yeah, so I, I started off life in, um, as an architectural grad in BVN, just doing projects and kind of made my way up um, to the point where I started to be involved in leadership of some projects. And I guess we were keen that in our studio director roles, generally what we do is we have architects um, running the studio because of, and I think what helps us or what we feel is a really important thing is you understand what it's, what it's like to be at the cold face. You understand what it's like to be in projects, managing teams, managing consultants. And then you kind of, you have a better understanding of when somebody comes and says, this is what I need and why I think we have, I'm not saying, of course we don't have an, an HR people um, we haven't and they don't, everybody has, but I think it allows you to have greater empathy to what people are going on. They kind of go, well, you understand what it's like, you know what, what it's like to be there. So I think that helps to a degree, but again, there's loads I could learn from HR colleagues and especially in the HR large practice group that are um, fantastic people who bring so much knowledge that we do. And it's a very sharing um, group. So that, that helps. Right, excellent. Um, so, look, you're here because, um, you know, I've heard you talk about flexibility a lot. I've heard you talk about the, um, uh, the, some, some of the systems that you've set up, which are really kind of um, innovative and fascinating. And, and I hope you'll talk to us about those a little bit. But I wonder if you can um, just start by talking about the motivation for, um, you know, for really trying to shift the practice into a uh, kind of model of, that really supports a model of flexible models of flexible work. Um, I mean, why does it matter and, and what does it mean for the practice? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things we, we, we coined this phrase back in um, 2017 for International Women's Day, 100% human. And it was an idea that we recognized that in essence, we're all human beings and um, Justine, and you know what it's like. Uh, 
stuff can be happening outside of work and inevitably you bring it to work. You can't help it. We're um, all our different emotions and um, feelings. If, if, if you're having a tough time outside of work, it's, it's going to, it's going to, you're going to, if you like, uh, no, no matter how professional you are, it's going to, it'll be there. It'll be just under the surface. So what we recognize is that look, every, um, if, if we put our people first, and we recognize that balance brings meaning to people's lives, then we should help them to be balanced humans. And by that, what do I mean is, um, and this is, and the key to flex is, and we get it too often is, it's only for people with caring responsibilities or for parents. And what flex is really about is um, people who make decisions in life um, to be it for, because the price of property in Sydney or in Melbourne and CBDs is too expensive that they, they move out. So they move an hour and a half away. So now they have a long commute and they might need to start a bit later or leave a bit earlier so they can have some time. So there's, it's an idea of recognizing that people do flex to hopefully get out into fresh air um, explore ideas. And if you like fuel their creative side, because we're a creative industry and the only way I mean, people are going to be more innovative and creative if, if they can fuel their, fuel themselves and then bring that um, creative energy to work. And when people, for me, if you watch it, if you're rigid about it, then they don't have flexibility. What happens is um, an anxiety creeps in because something pops up in your life. And because you fear how you're gonna adapt or get work or if there's inflexibility around your work situation in order to allow you to deal with that, now there's an extra layer of anxiety. There's the issue and there's the anxiety about, I, I can't resolve this. So what we recognize is that um, in crude terminology, shit happens and you can't predict when it happens. And what we want to do is give you um, assurances that look, we're happy. You juggle life, we'll juggle it with you. And the whole idea that, um, this idea that work and life is blurred. And I know that some people like the boundaries of it, but sometimes it, the blurriness actually is to your advantage. And what we're doing is there's an everyday flex. So there's two forms of flexibility. Just seems what we've learned is there's the everyday flex, which I would think everybody in every practice is more likely doing because they're going to see doctors or dentists or they're waiting for that Ikea delivery, and they, which is between eight and two or some ridiculous thing, thing that they end up um, have to spend the morning at home. And then there's the formal flex, which says I might be on a part-time arrangement or I'm working remotely for a day or two. So I think what you find is most people are familiar with um, the everyday flex, as we call it, but they don't think about it like that or they don't label it, so they don't see it. Um, and sometimes you just have to make people aware of that. And when that works well, I just think it just removes a layer of unnecessary stress and anxiety. So the motivation is to help our people to be um, well beings and healthy with less stress and anxiety and balanced, whatever that looks like to them in their phase of life. And I think the key to that is one size doesn't fit all with flex. It's different things to different people. Excellent. Alison, do you? Yeah, Brian, um, so that was the motivation. So where did you start? I'm assuming you didn't jump right in, polis bolus, that you must have started somewhere. Yeah, it's a good point. I think, um, and this is kind of advice we, when we look back at it about where we would encourage others who are thinking about diving in, Alison, is that have a look at what's already happening in your practice. That's the first thing I would do, rather than saying we need to do it. Let's understand what it is and um, get out there and talk to your people and do that depending on the scale. It could be two or three people. And you just have a meeting. If you're a bigger practice, you might need to do a survey, but establish what's, what's happening out there already and what are the needs of your people. And then start to, and then we didn't put any policies in place for many years. We sort of were living it and kind of understanding as we, as we went along, what's working, what's not working. And then we were using our experiences and the challenges we faced and how we navigated that to create a, a guideline for our people. But what I look back on now, and I think while we did it in a very loose way, that works for a lot of people, but for others, it creates uncertainty or it creates uncertainty around when they ask their leaders or their project leaders about a flex arrangement is not clear to them. So I think the importance is um, find out what's out there in your practice 
uh, establish what um, are the needs of your people and then create a clear, a, and it can be fairly simple, just a clear guide about who can apply and what does flex look like so that people have, if you like, the confidence to be able to go, I'd like to apply for X, Y, or Z. And I think that's a really important step is that then you will get consistency in how it is applied across the practice so that you don't have, if you like, um, more open project leaders encouraging it and a different style of leadership that is less open to the idea. So what you do is you have that fair and equitable situation where everybody knows what they're entitled to and then they can go after it. And then what you need, Alison, the key thing is you need your, your owners or your leadership to buy into it. They have to buy into it if they don't. It'll just get wide anted over time or certain people will get just inconsistent um, application of what good flex looks like. So how do you get that buy-in? Look, I, th I think when you, it comes back to the motivation, why are we doing this? If you tell them why, then what, <laughs> good humans will turn around and go, well, that makes sense. Of course, that's what we do. And, and the other thing is, um, and lots of people talk about this, but really it's about trust. And if we trust our people, they'll do the right thing. And we typically, of course we do, we do anyway. So I think this is just another step by saying we trust they'll do the right thing by projects every day. And this is just allowing them to most likely be the most effective people they can be. And by that is the guy from, um, I think Don Price from Atlassian, he talks about allow your people to do the best work of their lives, whatever that looks like to them. And I think that's what we do. I mean, we shouldn't be too rigid into, this is how you need to do things. It's like that crazy thing where you hire somebody and you tell them how to do it rather than you hire them and let them show you how best to do something. And I think there's, a, there's an element of that, that um, we all are, we've only got a finite amount of energy and, and um, passion and stuff that we can bring to our work lives and I think if you just allow people to bring the most that they feel they want to and need to to do it um, rather than us being a cause to diminish any aspects of that I think then that's important so when you talk to leaders like that and you're coming from a good place saying look this is good for all our people it's going to be good for you it'll be good for our projects which in turn in turn is good for the built environment a lot it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, when you go when you when you start to go into it. And the other thing is, and this is, of course, it's laughable now that we've had the uh, pandemic. But pre-pandemic, as we said, a hundred percent of our people aren't going to suddenly be knocking at our door saying we all want flex arrangements. There's quite a few, and and again, it depends on what phase of their lives they're in. They might need it now, but they might need it in two weeks or in a year. So that was the other thing as in we said, we wouldn't be suddenly rolled over with the whole practice suddenly wanting to work three days a week or whatever else. So once we talked through like that, they understood it, they were behind it and we launched, we launched the, um, the guidelines. And I think the other thing with that is you can't just tip it into the practice and expect it to work. What we did is we did a series of clinics, call them clinics, but it was where we went through the guidelines in detail and we people were allowed to ask questions and what about and there was several that we hadn't considered so we it gave us an opportunity then to formulate a response to that and it meant then that our people really understood what it was and then every six months we do a flex survey where we go how's it going and not just for those who are doing flex but those who are working with them how's it working for you what could we do better and they after the first six months and people had thought that and said that, look, we think it's a really good document. You seem to have thought of everything we hadn't and things, ideas came out and the communication one, we didn't emphasize that enough or we weren't clear on it. And the challenges that we had at the cold face were that some people just didn't communicate it. They just took off and started doing flex and didn't tell anybody. And somebody was like, oh my God, that's really interesting. Such and such isn't here. He's not here for our nine o'clock meetings anymore. And he just kind of strolls into 10 and talk to that person, they said, well, I'm on a flex arrangement, but they hadn't even talked to their teammates about it. So the, I can't emphasize enough, communication is huge. Communication both to the practice that it's out there and it's not just for parents, it's mm -hmm. for a whole host of reasons. And I think what helps with that is that we outlined, and we did this as well with the Champions of Changes, we went through all the practices and we went from what we could think of, there were seven or eight different reasons for lifestyle choices for why you use flex. Some is parental care, some is caring. And it's not just of kids. It could be family or siblings or 
um, elderly uh, parents or relations. There is uh, location, which is th those who choose to live far further away from um, the home based studio. Some people are pursuing their own little side gigs or their own little work, like they have another little business that they're doing. They want to try and get that off the ground. Some people are tutoring, they're getting further edu education. Some people are even thinking are getting educated to move out of architecture. So it's all these things that are perfectly viable reasons. And when you put them on paper, then there are reasons. So the, some people think it's just for parents or that's what their mindset is. And that's of some leaders and we're going, no, this is for everybody. And here are the reasons. And I think you have to be explicit on those things so that someone can point to it and go, I'm taking this flex arrangement for this reason. And here's what, here's why. I see. Yes. Because I think otherwise, if it is seen as something that parents and usually mothers take up, then it can get, um, you know, seen as a, as a uh, backwater, career backwater. So it really has to be available to everybody. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the resistance that you did come across? Um, and was that only from leadership or, or was it from, I mean, um, people within the practice or? Yeah, yeah it, it's mixed. I was, and it's interesting, it's, it's not until you do the surveys that this stuff comes out. Like some people still wrote in the survey is, um, I would love to do flex, but I'm, I'm not a parent. And I'm like, oh my God, have you read the part? Like the policy is explicit on this. But again, you just, it's like that thing they say that you have to communicate, you have to state something seven times before it lands. And that's an interesting thing because as leaders, you get anxious that, oh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be repeating myself. I need to be innovative. I need to be new message every time, but no, you have to just bang it on. This is not just for caring responsibilities. It's for everybody. The resistance came, more not that it wasn't at the fundamental principle of flexibility. It was where poor communication had let it down. Like, so people didn't know where somebody was in their team, or if you have multiple people in your teams on flex, and that could be, some could be doing everyday flex. Some people could be dropping off kids in the morning, coming in a bit later or coming in early so they can drop off kids. They just weren't communicating it. So the team leader didn't quite know where people were. So that was a bit of a challenge and, um, the other aspect was a perception and what it was the reality of the perception is that some people were taking on the load of load of others so someone's leaving earlier someone's doing less working less days so now i've got more work to do so again it comes back to i think setting your setting your team up for success so um helping our project leaders to articulate um who's in the team who's on flex arrangements uh, where we've delegated the, the roles so that everybody, it's a fair distribution of the workload based on the time that people have available. So I think they're the kind of things that we heard over time, Justine, and you probably still get pockets of it. And you mm -hmm. just got to keep bringing them back to our right, communication, communication. Um, and I guess the other big challenge was that, and again, because of the way our society is set up, it's more women take uh, parental leave than men. So when they come back there, especially if they're in a leadership role and they try and do that role five days in four or three. And the worst thing around that is they're getting paid for three and probably working five or paid for four and working five. So um, one of the things that we've explored through the Champions of Change is they, we've created a little pro forma, which helps people to go, okay, well, here is your role description. Here's what you can do in five days. Let's look at what can you do in four? What can you do in three? And the key to that is if that's a project leader, a project architect role description, let's say, it all depends on who that person is, like where are their best skills? Where do they have most impact? What are the bits of the project they want to hang on to? And then who in the team um, is interested in stepping up and taking on some of those responsibilities and not that you're loading them up, but actually they see it as a step up for them and a growth and a learning opportunity for them. So there's a positive in that. And it's just about that clear management of where do the aspects of the role go so that it is distributed evenly. And the other thing around that is what, if we do all that well and communicate, I think the key is you, you help to eradicate. There's an incredible guilt that certain moms, pr predominantly moms feel about, I've got to go now, I've got to go now because I have this, and let's be honest, this other job, which is parenting. And that's the thing, we you used to get the language of, oh, what do you do in your day off? Or like, this your day off to anybody who is out of the office, which is 
all been helped now by a pandemic that has taught everybody that you can work from home. Being at home doesn't necessarily mean it's a day off. So look, I think there's, we're still learning, Justine, and um, that's, that's the key to this. You just got to keep listening to your people, understand what the issues are, and try and evolve your um, frameworks and your guidelines to, to help support them. Brian, we've got a, a question here from Renee. I'm not sure if Renee is here to ask it, which relates to communication of, of this. Renee, are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. Uh, so my question was, um, when it comes to managing the communication in your teams, was this predominantly handled by the team leader uh, or HR or a bit of both? That's a good question. So um, we, we produced a little checklist, Renee, that actually started with just say, I'm the applicant looking to, to um, have some flexibility. I would um, chat with the team leader first to say, look, this is something I'm interested in doing. Can we do it? And then that would be relayed to the studio director so they understood what was happening. And then we went through a series of things. So we said, here are some things that the team leader is responsible for. Here's some that the applic applicant, the, the flexi or whatever is going to do. So we had to be very explicit on every single item and who did what. And to be honest, it's a mix. It's not one or the other. It's not, you don't push it on the person being flexed and say, you need to make sure you do all this. It's, no, hold on a second. As a team leader, there's a role that you play in this as well. So um, I think it's, and I think that's the thing we've realized is that flex is, it's quite a sophisticated thing. It has to be, if it's going to be good, it's got to be kind of sophisticated. So you've got to really live it and understand the nuances of every single thing to kind of go, okay, actually that's not going to work or what we said here before isn't exactly perfect. So I would always look at anything you do around flex. It's a dynamic live document that, needs constant nurturing and care because as our people evolve, as the um, situations and the flex arrangement themselves evolve, so do our guidelines and, and the framework that we set up to make it successful. But can you tell us a little bit about the app you've developed? Yeah, so um, the formal flex we found is pretty straightforward because, because it's so formal, it's very clearly documented. We have a, a running matrix of all the people who are in flex arrangements in the practice and there. So we can look at the gender balance of that. We can look at the reasons for it. We can then start to say, well, actually only, I don't know, 30% of our people are using flex for parental leave because people are seeing it for all these other reasons. But we said there's this everyday flex that happens that we just never capture and we never really truly understand. So what we did, um, and it must be over two years ago now, is um, there was a group um, of very smart uh, characters in BVN who were, some had computational design background, some had some sort of program background. So they, a series, and we said, look, I came to them, I said, I just want to know what people are doing it'd be interesting to just see how do people flex in their lives so that we just have a better sense of how people like to work. So they came up with what we called an app. Um, so in, its, in the truest sense of the word, it's not an app, but in essence, what you do is you um, go to an app and you type in your name, your studio, and you we call it in coming in later, which is uh, not quite correct but you'd say why you're not coming in so i'm sick or i'm at a site visit and i'll be in at 11 30 or i'm on leave or for whatever reason you would put that in and you'd submit it or i've got a doctor's appointment from 10 to 11 and i'll be in the studio afterwards and we asked people to engage with this just to let us know what was happening in life so the key to that is you need some uh, key figures and characters in the studio who engage with it and you need uh, some leaders to be champions and use it and talk openly about why they need, if you like, the informal flex in their lives. And we had to nag them and cajole them and get more people in. And, but over time, um, the usage started to go up. And then it certainly started to snowball because people saw that, um, oh, hold on a second, this is a really great thing. So when I get up in the morning and I'm feeling dreadful, I can, let's say it's 6.30, I can quickly say I'm sick and I can submit it and I don't have to be wait till 8.30 till reception comes on. So I ring them to tell them that I'm sick. Um, so what people start to do is going, I'm going to the doctor. Um, 
I've got a uh, kindy orientation with my kids. So I'm going first day. So people start to share these wonderful things about what they needed in life to lead a balanced life. And the more people shared, the more it encouraged and gave people, other people confidence to share. And then there was all sorts of stuff going on there to the point where we go, okay, there's over, we don't need to know why you go to the doctor. The doctor's appointment will, will suffice. But with people who went uh, storm last night, roof leak will be in later on today. So suddenly you just had this insight into, oh yeah, like this is it. This is the, this is, this is the lives that our people are leading. And it was lovely to see parents doing things and not feeling guilty about going to this sports event or going to the sports carnival or doing stuff. And I'm sure that it started conversations in other households where they went, well, I saw there was five people went to that thing today. You told me you couldn't, how could they go and you can? So hopefully it encourages better conversations around why we do stuff. Or when we were at the transformations event, um, Justine, someone came up to me and said that they got their people, especially um, respective genders, my turn to care for a sick kid, I'm caring for them today. And they were encouraging people to say my turn so that you didn't just see the, uh, predominantly um, women doing every time someone's a kid, so always the woman has to do it. Now, again, it doesn't recognize the diversity of uh, relationships and what's out there, but it's a good thing to do so that you see more people and you start to see a bit of balance and diversity of usage in those things, which is a healthy thing. So that was a really great tool. And it took about 18 months to gain momentum. And then it was it like it kind of blew up. It was everybody was using it. But what we also did, which was, I think, a really nice thing is we linked it to the leave application so that we'd see who was on leave, but we'd also see who was on parental leave so that you saw names. People, people didn't drop off the radar for 12 months and you didn't know where they were. You saw their name popping up every day. Or if they were back in the days when we traveled in state for jobs and whatever else, you'd see someone is in different locations. So this what the way they developed it was that at around 9 30 if everyone submitted their info before 9 30 it would auto generate an email to the entire studio saying here's where everybody is today so what that then in turn did was it it cut down the amount of foot traffic to reception saying where is whoever it then gave project leaders an insight into where people were during the day and all of a sudden we had a handle on that here is a huge amount of our people who are flexing in whatever way and are not in the studio today for these different reasons. So I think it was, it, it just brings a transparency to it. And then for me, it starts to um, remove any uh, fears people have about, oh, well, it's not for me or I can't do that to kind of, it, it, I think it's a reinforcement that, look, we are serious. You can, you can use the everyday flex to just balance life, whatever it looks like. So I think it was, it became, a, it's a simple tool, but it was very, very effective. Brian, um, a couple of things that you've said just have, have brought a question to my mind, um, which is to do with modeling of flex from the highest levels. So in terms of, um, you know, you know, they, they, research shows that unless, unless your leaders are modeling particular behavior, it's very hard for people you know, lower down to feel comfortable and safe about engaging in behaviour, even if it's supposedly okay. So has, I'm interested to know in, in the, not just the lack of resistance, but the actual championing, championing, championing and practice at the most senior level of Vivian around, around flex. How has that gone? Yeah, so um, I think this, so this tool helped um, because if you had a formal flex arrangement and you were working remotely, it would pick up all that. So uh, it was something I figured um, for my own sanity that I needed to work from home a day a week. When you're very focused on people and interacting with people every day, I went to practice and said, um, to allow me to do my job to the best of my ability, I'm going to need a day at home to do stuff so I can focus on helping um, everybody in the office. So that was popping up every day. And I got a lot of feedback from people in the studio that they love to see that I was doing it. So that gave them the confidence to feel that they could come and do it as well. So it wasn't me, uh, if you like, tipping a policy into the practice and then not actually utilizing it myself. Um, and then from a leadership perspective, it, it depends, I guess, 
if I'm being honest, I would say that more of the principals in BVM will be using the informal flex or the everyday flex as opposed to a formal flex arrangement. And we did have Ninochka for a period was on um, part time when she came back after having her kid. Um, and that was a great thing to see in lots of ways that you saw someone coming back in and still being at the leadership of the practice and doing that. Um, and we had two if I look at it, so is the uptake uh, across the practice even? It probably isn't. It is in terms of the everyday flex, but formally it depends on what stages of life people are at. So um, we, I think at the studio director level um, and Lenny who's doing it now, he works, uh, well, pre-pandemic, used to work a day from home and we would do different things and he commutes long distance. So he would flex his hours that way. So he was someone who was utilizing a couple of different reasons around the flex guidelines. And that certainly is good for people to see. And I think there was a few, pro there was quite a, a good amount of project leaders who were using it as well. So yeah, I think the mix is pretty good there. Enough that we didn't, well, if we put it this way, I didn't have people going, well, they're not doing it. So I don't feel comfortable doing it. That's not something that I came up against. Um, we've had another question from Renee, actually. Renee, do you want to jump on? This is a wages based question. Is she there? Yeah. Hello, sorry. Um, yeah, so just, I've been looking at the Architects Award. I'm looking at bringing on staff. I want to offer as much flexibility as I can. Um, so I'm just wondering how you negotiate working hours between the Architects Award and the hours that are outlined as, I guess, typical working hours in that award. Okay, so Renee, do you mean if it's 40 hours versus the what the award is, or are you meaning less? Um, I guess the typical hours are, I can't remember if it's between 8 and 6 p.m., otherwise you're um, looking oh, at... Oh, the ordinary hours. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Um, that's a good question. So what, what we do is, typically what we say is, if there's a formal arrangement which is going to impact your contract, then we talk to payroll and we, we work it out with them and say, so before you apply for a formal flex arrangement, we say, here are things for you to consider and here are all the things that so we outline all the possible things that in case, what we don't want is people getting 90% there and then getting a surprise and going, oh, I didn't think that was going to be an, an impact to me of based on going for flex. So we start to talk to them very early on about what are the impacts financially or how we're going to manage situations like that. What we said is we, in that, at the working hours, it's, it's a really good question, Renee, is we looked at, um, given we are a collaborative industry in what we do, what we said is you couldn't have a flex arrangement from 11 p.m. to like 6 a.m. like just because that suits you because you're going to have to engage with others in what you're doing. So what we tried to look at and said is, okay, so previously your contracts might have said the ordinary working hours were typically 8, 8.30 to 5.30. But look, very few people at, within our lunch, very few people actually do that. So what we said is we tried to look at it as a window between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So you could flex around inside and that. So you could come in a bit earlier if you needed to leave early, or you could come in a bit later and work a few hours later on. And we said, that's sort of the window. Anything beyond that, we'd need to be having conversations and see what would be the impact to your teammates or people you're working with around that. So with that, then we had payroll, just check and make sure that things are all right. But look, I, I would say this, Renee, it, anything to do with the award, it's a very complex area given the dynamic nature of people's hours. So if you have people working beyond their core hours and their honor near the award, it's already a complicated situation that you need to have your payroll people on top of. So yeah, always complex when it's anything to do with the award. Yeah, the Architects Award um, sets the ordinary hours as between 8 and 6 p 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And um, I know that that, um, that can be a challenge around the flexibility. So. Um, uh, Renee, that might also be something you might want to take up with the ACA, <laughs> who negotiate the award on behalf of employers. Um, but that is certainly um, a consideration. Um, and um, I think it's really important that things like the award um, protect people, um, but also don't um, impede things like flexibility. So it, that is another discussion I think that's worth having. Okay, I'm very interested to know what happened in the pandemic. I've been hearing a la vast amount of anecdote that um, 
the practices that already had some kind of support and processes and policies um, and systems around flexibility, particularly flexibility in terms of where you work, were um, better positioned to pivot, as they say, when everyone suddenly had to leave. Um, and the other thing I've been hearing a lot of is that it was around workplace culture. So those um, practices which had um, a kind of uh, an environment which was principally built around trust also pivoted quite well. Those that were um, in a more command and control uh, kind of workplace culture have really, really struggled. And those people who are used to managing um, staff in that way have really struggled. So I'm um, just kind of, I mean, I guess this is the kind of business case a little bit, isn't it? It's the, um, yep. it, it builds a kind of resilience potentially into the practice when you have to deal with unexpected mm. things. So this is a bit of a Dorothy Dixer, I guess, but has that been your experience? <laughs> did, yeah. it, did it set so, you up well? well <laughs> I, yeah, in lots of, I think we were very fortunate um, on two fronts. One was from a technology perspective, like five or six years ago, we went fully Citrix. So we had this ability, like, we all had the ability pre pandemic to work from home. So you, in essence, you just needed a good internet connection and um, the computing power and all the software and everything lived in BBN. So you didn't have to have a powerful laptop or machine at home for which to log in and do. So we were all familiar with that and that was allowing, and that's the other thing to be honest, before that is you do need good te tech to, um, tech should enable flexibility. And it did because what we had is people for different reasons uh, they were going off triathlon training or uh, pickups or tutoring and then they wanted to log on later on at night and they had the ability to do that at home they didn't have to go into the studio to do it so we had this tech in place we still needed some stuff to be done like we had to check was the bandwidth that we had we had in bbn it didn't necessarily cater for everybody in the practice being at home at one time so um we had uh mark solomon our cio was in place so it was great we had I think it helped that we had in the group who were planning around this crisis is we had someone with a lead with a people hat on with someone with a technology hat on and they weren't business owners who were trying to juggle projects and all this stuff on top of it. So I think that set up and our scale certainly helped it. So we had the technology in place to allow people to go home quickly. We very quickly established too that for those who had worked at home a day or two ad hoc or even more formally, they were all very familiar with what it's like to set your day up at home for success, but not everybody had done that. And for some, it was quite an arresting thing to suddenly be sitting at home um, by yourself working. So what we did is we um, published a whole series of work from home guides about, hey, these are the kind of things that set you up for success. Um, we obviously talked about OHS, how you set yourself up in a safe way. So working off the corner of your bed is not going to be sustainable for, and this is the thing, it wasn't for a day or two. We knew it was going to be a chunk of time. So you had to sort of take the time to set yourself up properly. We let people take home monitors, chairs, keyboard and mice and bits and pieces. Some people who needed computers, that's what we did. So when we got them home, I think it was relatively seamless. Yeah, there was a few issues, but we did tutorials as well on how to set yourself up um, from a technology perspective. So, and we had teams, so that allowed people to communicate really quickly and they were familiar with it. It wasn't like we thrust a new thing on them. So I think the pivot that you describe was easier than for some because it was all established things that they had around them. It wasn't new technology. It wasn't new platforms and softwares and it wasn't a new uh, way of working for quite a few people. So yeah. that went incredibly well. Um, I think the key now for us is, and to your culture point, I, we've been reading some good articles because it has suffered. It's not the same. We opened up our studios in July and the numbers coming back have been quite slow. So they were slowly people are coming back and it's for a whole host of reasons. Um, some people have found new balance. Some people have found their commute time back where they're getting to spend time with loved ones or doing other things, being out in the fresh air. You have um, some people who were gagging to get back. And that's the thing to understand that remote isn't brilliant for everybody. It's a bit like, and this is, I think this is the way to, um, I was thinking about this the other day. This is probably the way people who haven't do who don't have flex need to think about it. Just like working remotely doesn't suit everybody because it depends on what kind of home environment you have, whether you live by yourself, it could be lonely. I honestly don't think five days in the studio works for everybody either. And I think you need to picture it like that. So, and then hybrid is that mix in between that 
balance. So some people will really want to be in the studio five days and that's totally fine. And for others, it's a mix of three or four days or whatever suits them. So we, I'd like to think we had a pretty healthy culture and one of trust that we, that was underpinned by trust. And I think that certainly seemed to um, showcase that when everyone went home because our effectiveness didn't drop. People did an incredible job. We were keeping up with our projects. We weren't missing deadlines, which is brilliant. And it kind of set up a successful platform in lots of ways, I think probably for us to win more work because suddenly we clients are going, look, they can do this no matter what's happening in, in the context around them. But I think we have drawn down on our cultural reserves that we have banked over time because it, it, when you don't have that um, collective coming together and feeding off each other and the energy that comes from that, I think it does diminish it a, a little. And while we came out, we said, look, early on, we said everyone can work from home or don't have to be back in the studio until January because some people change things dramatically in their lives. Some people moved back in with their parents. Some people moved away from Sydney. Some people did, uh, took people out, of, kids out of childcare and different, different aspects. We knew that you couldn't reverse that so quickly. And some people are put in place and invested in items to allow them to work effectively at home. And we said, okay, in your own time, let's start to come back. But now we're starting to say, look, it would be nice to see people a couple of days because our culture has suffered a little bit. That thing that is important, the thing that that sense of belonging, you start to lose that. Now, I found it myself. I was very comfortable working from home, but after a while, you just, you get very narrow in your field of who you think BBN are. And it was only the 20 people that I would have been dealing with regularly. And beyond that, it could have been a 20 person practice for all I knew. So um, the day I walked back into the studio and I went, oh my God, I forgot I'm part of this thing, this bigger thing you, you kind of need to reconnect a little bit and be part of it. And I'm not saying that you have to all pour back into the studio, but I think in some way, um, I think one of the principles Kevin O'Brien talked about it beautifully, where he talked about it's a bit like in orbit. So the studio has an orbit and your own has an orbit and you just need to intersect them a little. You need that little bit of intersection. It's just good. Some people get recharged energy wise from it. Some people just like to connect socially. Um, so I think culture is one of the biggest challenges I see. And the other one is leadership because certain leadership styles suited having people in the studio. As you say, they, I can see everybody is the kind of command and control idea. And that would have been quite jarring to suddenly not see anybody. So there had, they had to adapt their styles. So we sent them a whole series of video tutorials and readings to say, hey, if you're struggling, here's some things to think about. Um, and I think probably one of the things we'll need to do um, is to come up with some sort of leadership training to teach how do you effectively manage hybrid teams. And I think that's something that we need to all evolve into to do it successfully. And I think one of the things we found that people get teams or Zoom fatigue and understand it, but they, it looks like our feedback is that the standups are very successful every day and find time to, I know people are so tired of them want to get off and get to the business point and get it over and done with, but you need to invest in that little bit of social banter beforehand the connection and just understand what's going on in each other's lives so that people become, the danger with that I see is they become resources. They become just things to do stuff as opposed to human beings who are living lives and what's going on. And yeah, so tough times, I think. Right. Take a breath, Brian. Um, <laughs> um, now, someone called McDonald, I don't know your first name, um, has got a question here about how to deal with certain leaders. Um, yeah, it's I, David, David McDonald. Hi, great. Um, I, Brian's kind of answered some of that already, but I just wondered if you wanted to, if you, there was anything more that you would like to ask him in, in, on that topic. Sure. Uh, I actually, I work for a, a construction company called Roberts Pizzerotti. Um, ah. if, any, if anybody, you know it, you know that our uh, CEO is incredibly forward thinking and um, very much on board with, with flexible working and all those sorts of things. And it's, it's fantastic. And I've, I've really enjoyed it in the move from architecture into um, construction uh, and management on that side. <clears throat> all that being said, there still is some mindsets among certain of the older staff and even with, you know, I mean, the, the message is very, very clear from the top that this is the way we're going. It's flexible and it's how we need to operate and how we need to work. Flexible people are happier people. Flexible people are more sort of um, productive and they get a lot more work done um, because they're happier. Um, and flexible people do tend to work 
probably more than your standard nine to fivers as well because because you feel that you kind of have to do that but there there are still um older members even within a, in, in the realms of Robert's Pizzerotti that still have that they need to see you sitting at a desk to feel that you're actually doing some work um and you know if if someone like uh, if someone like Robert's Pizzerotti is still not I wouldn't say struggling with it but still getting around that in our sort of four years of operation um how, how would you sort of go about that Brian and, and what sort of ways of how do you have you had that within BVN where you've got some of the older directors that are like no I need to see I need to see you at your desk with your model spinning around in 3D <laughs> to know that you're doing some work or um, uh, I think David it's, it's a good question I think that would have been a much bigger challenge for everybody pre the pandemic but when everyone was thrust home and they, ha they had to deal with it I think what everybody observed is well hold on a second projects didn't fall over people actually got on with it and did what they needed to do which is a great thing and i think my key take on that is that everybody has evolved their thinking over mm -hmm. that period and at some at different rates compared to others and all i would encourage you to do is understand the fears that are underpinning their resistance that's it and then talk, you can talk quite rationally through well hold on a second um if it's pr productivity here are the stats or here, here's here's six months of work that there hasn't been any um, reduction in productivity. People are doing well. Um, if there's well-being perspective, we can do it. I think you can, that would be my key. Just be inquisitive, understand what's, what are those fears and then start, you will no doubt have the data around you to, to counter any of those and to reassure them and kind of say, let's just be open mind about this. Let's just keep doing it. Um, I hear what you're saying. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll monitor it and we'll see how we go. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've been trying to convince them to do a couple of days from home um, to see how it goes, but uh, it's not well received <laughs> as of yet. And, and, yeah. and look, here's the, so the other thing to that, and, and this is, I think this is important too, is um, because I like flex or you like flex and we, and it works well for us, it's the, it doesn't fit everybody. And if they want to be in this studio and they want to work in that way, and that's kind of the way they're hardwired, as long as they don't transfer those expectations onto others, then I'm totally fine. With it. That's that kind of diversity of humans that are around you and you kind of have to respect that that's how they are because there are people in the office who like to do well beyond our core hours. And I've always gone, no, it's a well-being issue. And I kind of went, actually then I went, well, actually, if that's how they're wired and how they want to do it, that's okay by them. Who am I to say that they have to be out in the world doing other things? Yeah. If that's what, if, they, if they're driven by that and that's what gives them the best job satisfaction and they can do it in a healthy way, then you just have to go tip your hat to them, each to their own, support it and allow them to do it. But in each case, don't let them transfer their expectations onto others. I think that's the key. Thanks, thanks Brian. Brian, um, what advice, um, and I guess particularly now having gone from, having started to put these flex policies in place pre-pandemic, now having them truly tested through the pandemic to the sort of the nth degree, what sort of advice and insights would you have for um, both uh, practice owners um, and directors, but also for individuals looking to, to engage in a more flexible um, workplace and work life? Yeah, look, I think for practice owners, um, this isn't the value add, this is the norm now, this is expected. Like any, it, uh, if you're gonna hang on to, if you're gonna retain talented people, you are going to have to um, be open to flex because I think that's what people expect. And if you're not gonna give it, I'm pretty sure the majority of places, practices around you are, are gonna do it. And I think, and here's the key, I think this has been the big thing for me is, it's a bit like, we didn't question getting on public transport and commuting for X amount of hours and going to turning up at work as part of what we did now. And now we have suddenly had our eyes and worlds open to a whole different way of working and the benefits of maybe not doing that five days a week to the point where I'm going, well, I'm not crude language, but they're not going to give that freely anymore. They're not going to, they're, not, they're going to question things now that they didn't question before. So you, 
those people can't hanker for the old culture and how they used to do things. That's gone. It's like culture is evolving all the time and it's evolving based on the context of what's happening around it. So people's cultures from uh, February this year are very different now, whether we like it or not, and you can't control that. And we just have to evolve and make sure that we're, we are, we, we're hitting the right mark and we're doing the right thing by, by what our people want. So my thing for business owners, you must be open to it. And the thing I would say to you is just find out what people want. I think part of the fear is flex and not understanding it. Just find out what people are looking for. And I'm pretty sure that it's, it's rarely that it's de detrimental to the team or to the project. People work around, people always want to do the right thing. They want to do good projects. So the thing is allow them to do that. And for people, I would go understand key drivers, why you're doing it, uh, what you're doing, and think through yourself, what would be the impact to my team or to my project? Because if you can think, if you've thought through that, then you can have the conversation with someone and understand that and say, look, I've already thought about this and this is, this is how we could navigate that. Or I've thought about that. This is what I think we could do. So I think you have to think through it. You can't just turn up and say, I want to go flex and just blurt it out. There's, you really have to consider it now and understand it. And know what, what's the motivation for you because I think that's important. Excellent. Well, I think that's probably a good place to end. Um, and I'm trying to keep to time because, um, you know, I, I so often go over when Naomi's not here and Alison's. <laughs> so um, I think that, that's incredibly helpful. Um, and it's very, um, it's really good to just have that kind of detailed understanding of um, what you have been doing. And um, there's a lot of lessons, I think, for uh, practices of all sizes. And I think that just that thing that it's a work in progress is, I think, very important to understand that we're, obviously, we're all adapting very quickly right now. Mm. Um, but that, that adaptation and experimentation doesn't kind of end, um, I think, is a fluid. It's a good, good thing. Exactly. Alison, do you have anything else you'd like to... Um, my only question, and you might have answered this anyway, is, is has anything come out of this that you weren't expecting? Hmm. Were there any unforeseen sort of outcomes, either positive or negative? Um, I think, yeah, well, I think the key to this is um, that even when you consider flex and you go flex and balance is uh, different to everybody in different phases of life, you can't band them together in demographics and say that demographic all lived alone, so they're lonely, whatever else. And parents either love the flexibility and want to be at home. Some parents wanted to run out of the house and get some free and quiet time inside in the studio. So I think it's the openness that no matter what the drive for, it's different for everybody. It's totally different for everybody. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of diversity is that people see things in different ways and they've got different circumstances and I think just always be open to that that it's park all the biases that you might have or unconscious or whatever that okay this is kind of what I'm expecting or I'd expect of someone in that position or that time of their life just be totally open who knows why and that's what I'm saying just deal with each application or each conversation on its merit and be open to it because people do it in different ways and I think to help and I'm hoping this is a key one for parlor and, and we were all said we were happy to share our documents and guidelines so that people could see some stuff. So I think that's still in our to-do list. But as part of that, Justine, with the Flex Group in Champions of Change is we've put together a, a document that talks about how you would go about setting up Flex Framework, some insights from practices, and we've also inc all included our policies so people could see different scale practices with different policies so they can have a look through, ah, that's what it looks like, and then they can start to create their own ones. So I'm hoping that will help other practices who are starting on the journey or in the middle of the journey and looking to adapt um, from their current position. Yes, I think that's something to note that the champion, the both groups of the champions of change are busy uh, producing uh, what they're calling toolkits for how to, how they've done things that might help others. Um, and in fact, I've just got a missed call right now from um, someone about that, probably asking me where the thing I meant to have written is. Um, but uh, we are going to look at um, Parler and, and the MCC is going to look at partnering on getting that stuff out. So um, that will be coming, I think, probably in the early new year. Um, so there are, um, I mean, we're very keen. There are a lot of practices, you know, trying stuff out and um, keen to share that knowledge. And I think that's very helpful. So um, 
more will be coming soon. And uh, we actually have Alison Mirrens from Roberts Pizzerotti speaking with us in early December, back with Natalie Galea. So that will also be a good, um, a great session. Um, we do actually know what the session next week is even. I've had a fit of organisation. I've booked them well up in advance. Um, we've got Shanine Fenton and Belinda Allwood from uh, Pod in Cairns, which is a fabulous um, small practice in Cairns. Um, giving us one of the, some views from the regions. Um, so that will be a really, they're really hilarious and funny and smart and switched on. And I think it'd be a great session too. So I hope to see you all there. Um, we have got on Tuesday next week, we are doing a Wikipedia edit-a-thon in the evening, um, looking specifically at uh, improving the representation of Indigenous women on Wikipedia. So for those of you who are interested in writing, that might be something you want to come along to learn how to, learn how to navigate the very weird world of Wikipedia. Um, uh, what else have we got coming up, Alison? I can't even remember what we're doing. There's so many things. <laughs> um, that might be it for now. We finished our lunchtime sessions, haven't we? Our Monday lunchtime. Yes, the, the students and young grad sessions have finished. Um, actually, that's something I'm very interested. We are, as I said, I've got quite a lot of sessions booked up. Uh, we're running these, this series till the end of the year. Um, we are then thinking about what we do next year. I've got to say, these have been so successful. I'm quite keen to keep them going in some form or other. I'd be really like to know from you all if um, that's something that you would appreciate. Um, if, but I'm also trying to think about what we might do in January. And in particular, I'm quite keen to have a break for a little while. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, we are starting to think about where we go next, um, what we keep, keep going with that we've developed in this kind of weird pandemic world and what we might um, stop and what we might develop. So I'd be really, I haven't got any formal mechanism of feedback right now, but if um, I would be really interested to know what you think. Please keep them going. Keep them going is coming into the comments. Well, that's very good to hear. <laughs> And do people like weekly or should we go to fortnightly? That's another question I have, um, which is partly uh, about my own sanity. But uh, let's see. <laughs> Send me feedback. Okay, cool. Is that it? We just had a reminder, which we did speak about earlier, but everyone may have missed it. It's about the Parlour Lab on Architecture on Indigenous Lands, which is on the 16th of November. Yes. And bookings, can I tell you, bookings are flooding in. We've got over 200 people RSVP'd for that. We've got a limit of 300 because of the sort of what you can do in a Zoom meeting. So um, if you do want to come to that, it might pay to book sooner rather than later. Um, Carol Go Sam and Deidre Brown. Deidre's a New Zealand academic. Um, so that will be a great session. Okay, happy Friday.